tonight. Can a unique program help stop bullying in New Zealand schools? A councillor is doubling down on plans to bring a crowdfunded chocolate factory to Dunedin, but will it work? And it's Josh versus the Aussie Ninja Warrior course. Ah! And Josh comes up a bit short. But before that, when's the right time to put up the Christmas tree? An etiquette expert says not yet. Wait until December 17th. This is The Project. You saw that story just then, but people are already putting their Christmas trees up, really? and other people are not happy about it. Which yep. seems, is, have you got a Christmas I'm, tree? I'm outnumbered at home. Megan and the daughters both, uh, they all want to put the Christmas tree up. I've said not until December, or at least until you've taken down the Easter tree. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know it was a thing until I. <laughs> you actually have an Easter tree. There was an now. Easter tree. Yeah, there was an Easter tree. Um, can I say, if a Christmas tree brings you joy? then you don't let anyone tell you when you can put it up. You put that Christmas tree up and you enjoy the festive season from me, Jesse, tonight. Good on you, Jesse. And, and I, I agree. Get as much Christmas stuff as you want. I'm on my fifth uh, chocolate advent calendar already. <laughs> <laughs> get involved, get involved. Now, today, addressing our terrible suicide rates, the new health minister said that too many of our young people are dying because we don't have the right solutions. Well, a new pilot plan might be one such solution. It aims to stop bullying from getting out of control and hurting our most vulnerable kids. I thought they're my friends. Make me sad and nervous and angry. When a group of girls befriended 15-year-old Holly Reid, she truly believed she was part of the gang. You're like her lunchtime friends, is what she calls them. But the girls were taking advantage of Holly's trusting nature. They encouraged her to take her top off on camera and shared it online through Snapchat. This has probably been going on for about, oh, easily half a year. Please say sorry. Don't do it again. Holly's story is shocking, but it's not uncommon. You've got traditional bullying and then you've got the pain and you know, constant harassment of cyberbullying to be added on top. So I think for a lot of young people, being bullied is tougher today than it ever was. Cyberbullying is a crime under the Harmful Digital Communications Act. But while offenders have been charged, even jailed, experts say it's not changing the culture of bullying. Hope may come in the form of a new program being trialled in 30 schools across the country. Kiva is a Finnish anti-bullying program that arrived on our shores back in 2015. It's built around changing the behaviours of the group of students that stand around any incident. If we can get them to change and move over to being defenders, then we're a long way um, solving the problem. So could Kiva be the key to finally stamping out what has always been the worst part about growing up for kids like Holly? Well, to give us a little bit more insight into that programme, we have the principal of Baradine College, Sandy Pasley, with us now, along with Charlotte, who is a Baradine student. I'll start with you, Sandy. You've been using the Kiva programme in your school for a couple of years. How is this different to what I went through at school with, say, a peer support system? I think the thing about Kiva is it's well researched. It comes out of Finland and they have got it and it's present in a whole lot of different countries and they've been able to track progress of student attitudes with Kiva over time. And for us, I think it, we brought it in so we would teach the students resilience and how to step up and take action if they see something happening that's not appropriate or that's um, harmful to somebody else. Charlotte, how does Kiva work from your perspective? Um, so everyone in class, everyone gets taught like not to be a bystander, who to talk to, like if you're getting bullied, if you see someone else getting bullied. And it's just great to know that everyone knows what to do if they see someone getting bullied or if they are getting bullied. So although it may not be happening at Baradine right now, they do know what to do if it does start to happen. But do you always know what bullying looks like, Charlotte? Well, it's repeated, it's intentional, and it's harmful, and that's what we've been taught. Sandy, I like the sound of Kiva. Is there something I can do as a parent? I've got t two young girls, obviously don't want them to be bullies or be bullied. Is, what, what can I do at home as a parent? I, I think as a parent, if you see um, your child doing something that's hurtful to somebody else, that you talk to them about how that person's feeling and how they might feel if it was happening to them. 
And I, I think actually making them aware of others and their feelings is a really good thing to do as a parent. Well, usually they're picking on me, so I guess, uh, yeah, <laughs> good opportunity for learning. Sandy, I bet bullying has been going on since humans were going to school in caves. Any chance that it's just part of life as a kid and by getting rid of it, you're actually going to make kids less resilient in the long run? I don't think you need bullying to make students resilient. Um, it may have been going on for a long time, but I think now is a good opportunity in our society to stop it. And it's great to see people stepping up and saying enough's enough um, in different aspects of our community. Sandy and Charlotte from Baradine College, thanks for your time. Thank thanks, you. Thanks very much for having us. Oh, the, the reason I asked that question about recognising bullying is because you and I were chatting earlier on today about stuff that we did at high school and like, I would never ever consider myself a bully but then you look back at it now and you go well that probably wasn't very enjoyable for the person yeah. that was doing it too, right? And it wasn't in a cave as you alluded to. Yeah, <laughs> and so I guess the point of this program is that you need to educate not just you know, the bystanders and not just the people being bullied but the people doing it to know what's right and wrong. Sounds quite promising. Yeah, totally. Hey, and an update on what's happening with Holly's horrible bullying experience. Holly was the young girl in the story we saw just before that interview. Her school, Wellington East Girls, have confirmed that police are investigating what happened to her. No charges have been laid yet. Well, it's time for some political news now, and we've got some hard-hitting stuff. Jacinda Ardern has been given a shirt. <laughs> uh, well, all the leaders at APEC were, but Jacinda was the only one who got asked this weird question. I'm not, no, we want I'm not going to sniff the yeah. shirt on camera. No, we all want to <laughs> That's how to live, eh? It's been my dream to have a job where people have to sniff my shirts. <laughs> <laughs> one whatever, day, whatever, Josh. One day. One day. Right. She proved herself quite prime ministerial there, though, didn't she? Mm. By learning to say no quite forcefully. Mm. I mean, John Key would have sniffed that shirt. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and we'd still be talking about it. He would have made it. He would have turned it into... Yeah. Uh, we would have been playing the footage of John Key <laughs> sniffing that shirt for the next four or five years. It would have been great. <laughs> Unfortunately, Jacinda's let us all down. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, to Dunedin now. This only kicked off this morning, but the crowdfunding campaign to keep Dunedin's chocolate industry going is now over halfway to reaching its $2 million goal. Everyday Kiwis are buying a piece of the new venture, but are they investing with their hearts instead of their heads? The money has been pouring in like liquid chocolate. When Dunedin councillor Jim O'Malley tried to save the Cadbury Chocolate Factory, his Own the Factory campaign raised nearly $6 million. That wasn't to be, but Jim's got a new campaign to stop Dunedin's chocolate centre from melting away. The aim this time is to raise $2 million to grow boutique Dunedin chocolate maker Ocho into something much bigger. I think we'll raise it all today, I'm pretty, pretty sure. Shares in the new company are available for $100 a pop, and they're literally sweetening the deal by offering shareholders discounted chocolate for life. Next year's 150 years of chocolate making in Dunedin, and so we want to keep that proud history here, really. The new company will operate like a co-op, with a limit of 11% ownership for any one shareholder. By midday, the campaign had hit almost half its target, but is it really a sweet deal for investors? Really, it's investment that's based around people and relationships. And there's an inherent trust there because of the social proximity between the person investing and the person that's campaigning. With 350 former Cadbury staff out of work over the next five months, it's hoped Ocho's expansion could be the golden ticket to a new chocolate-coated future for Dunedin. But how long until investors are swimming in it? Well, joining us now for an update is the man driving the campaign, Jim O'Malley. You're after a cool two million. You're not quite as far along as you thought you would be, but when are you expecting you might get there? Yeah, I might have been a bit optimistic, say four o'clock, but um, <laughs> maybe during the night. I mean, I think after these guys, after people have seen us on this show, we'll get another boost. So here's what I know about investing in companies: uh, you diversify. You do your research and you don't buy companies just because you like their product. But you're asking us to break all of those rules to invest in your company. You should always buy a company if you like the product. Um, I think you'll find if you look at what we're doing, it's actually a pretty sound investment. And, um, you know, it's all very value added too. We're talking about the top end of chocolate. We're not going to make a high candy product here. We're talking about, you know, craft chocolate, which is a nice product. Uh, if I spend 800 bucks, get eight shares. Could I sell them in a few years' time and make a few few grand? 
Yeah, we'll be selling them. We're not on a public environment, but we can sell them internally inside the company. So we'll be making lists of people who want to buy and then lists of people who want to sell. Of course, the gushing thing about losing the Cadbury factory in Dunedin is the loss of jobs. How many jobs could this new project create? At, at first, it's not going to create many. We're only going to make a ton of chocolate a week, which is a lot for a single person to eat, but it's, a, it's not all that much um, production-wise. But we did go to the Cadbury Workers um, Job Fair on Saturday, and we took all the names of people who would want to come and work for us as we add jobs back. And our t intention is to grow over the next five to ten years. Ocho is no Cadbury in terms of scale. Where's the market for your artisanal or boutique chocolate? We are ten times bigger than, than all the other artisan chocolate companies when we get going and we'll be about ten times smaller than where we want to be in about five years time. So we, what we're doing is with this two million we can get started, it will get a space on supermarket shelves and then from there we'll aggressively grow. Jim, I've heard rumours that uh, shareholders might be able to access discounted chocolate for life. <laughs> <laughs> Your thoughts? <laughs> well. <laughs> We thought it wasn't a bad bribe to give, you know, so um, yes, that is in fact, it's not a rumour, it's a fact. Um, if you're a foundation shareholder, which is people who buy in on this round, you'll get a 20% discount on the chocolate for life. Jim, it has been great talking to you. Good luck. Great. Thanks very much, guys. Yes. Well, I, I went to university in Dunedin and um, I once met a girl who worked at the Cadbury Chocolate Factory and I got very close to dating her and um, that was going to be the rest of my life sorted out. But, uh, <laughs> didn't just work out, just didn't work out, yeah. Well, maybe if everyone pitches in, we get this thing off the ground, there'll be opportunities for future young men to date women from the Cadbury Factory or the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> trying to keep that dream alive. Despite New Zealand getting skunked, whatever that means, out of the MTV European <laughs> Music Awards, it turns out many of the artists on the red carpet were showing a lot of love for Aotearoa. We've always got a special plate now, place in our hearts, haven't we, for anyone who loves us first. <laughs> Some people think I'm You're coming to New Zealand next year, is that right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm looking forward to that. I've just always had a good time there. I've always had, I've always had a good reception there, right from my first album, all the way back in 2003. Are there any New Zealand bands or, or artists that you I knew about Scrab way back. We've hung out, we've been on like, um, we did one of them travelling tours together. So I knew him since then, he was cool. He was an easy dude to get along with, man. Yeah. I heard you mention Lord's name just the oh, Who doesn't mention Lord's name? She's an inspiration. Even her music videos I find very inspiring. She's cool. So uh, that's why I brought it out. Maybe right. you next coming to New Zealand. Oh my god, I hope it's soon. Yeah. And I want to get back and just do a few more spots, to be honest. I think on the books at the minute, though. I remember no, nothing in the book. Well, I don't want to say that. I hope they're getting put in the books. Put right? this in your diary. Yeah, absolutely. Because we're even flying into New Zealand. It was like stunning. I love my New Zealand fans so much. It's actually my favourite place to come and visit. I've been to Hamilton and Auckland and then. Um... You went to Hamilton? Yeah, I was having the best time. It's so much fun. I'm so excited to come back to New Zealand. I mean, I haven't been there for such a long time. And I'm always very excited to go. And I hope I have time to kind of like look around your beautiful country, really. Um, so yeah, I'm stoked. It'll be very cool. Are there any New Zealand musicians that you're a particular fan of? Oh my gosh, I'm about. Wait, I'm putting you on the spot. Wait, hold on. Lord is from New Zealand. Spot on. Oh, and 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 broods. Well done. Come on, look at that too. <laughs> All right, great, great, great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pretty exciting. And uh, of course the red carpet will be rolled out in New Zealand later this week because the Vodafone New Zealand Music Awards are on Thursday and this one is hosting, giving out one of the awards. Oh, I'm so excited oh. but I'm so nervous. Oh, as soon as you say that, I'm like, oh my goodness, don't fall over. Don't you dare fall over oh, on national fun. television. Hey, coming up in a few moments, if you're a fan of seeing people get really seriously injured, Josh had a horrible time a couple of weeks and we caught it on film. And that's coming up on the project after the break. <laughs> It's the Prime Minister's first big overseas trip. The opposition rates how she's going so far. And looking to become a true ninja warrior, Josh pushes himself to the limit, then goes that little bit too far. This is the project. Coming from petrol, we were sceptical, but the talk is amazing. With the battery line trimmer, there's less fatigue, so there's more accuracy. When we use the hedge trimmer, there's no fumes blowing into your face. The brushless motor is lighter than a conventional four-stroke engine. There's no compromising power at all. And we don't smell like petrol anymore. We smell like cut grass.
Chicken makes us furious. It's time to get more curious. Pairing chicken with the bear. Where does that go? Oh, up there. Even Bruce is branching out. Char Grill Burgers, it's a shout. Murray tried a Spanish class. Brazil drumsticks, gracias. Classic bangers, whoop de doo Yes, they're made from chicken too. Chicken that's been butterflied. Sauté flavored, open wide. Tandoori kebabs look good. Just don't eat the bits of wood. Mm -hmm. Time to jump on this new trend with an open-minded friend. If you're barbecue curious too, Teagle has a meal for you. Try Teagle chicken on your barbie. the project and we got some exciting news last week the tv award nominations were announced the project got a couple of nods but one of the most exciting ones was that my co-host here Kanoa lloyd has been nominated as the best presenter in the women's day people's choice award oh, look at that yes. oh, we are so proud of her look at those surrounded by those oh. big names. i'm not sure where they got that photo but anyway <laughs> we um we love Karnoi and we would invite you, if you're a big fan of her presenting as we are, to go online and vote for her. <laughs> or just do whatever you want. You're probably busy. We've it's put fine. a link on our Facebook page. She's, as you know, the best presenter in New Zealand. We'd love for her to get that award at the TV Awards. So All right. Nice. Karnoi Lloyd, guys. everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'll just try not to muck up the actual part of my job, which is to read some headlines for Monday the 13th of November. <laughs> A powerful 7.3 magnitude earthquake on the Iraq-Iran border has killed at least 200 people, a number expected to rise. More than 1,600 others have been injured and in just the past few hours a 6.5 magnitude quake has struck off the coast of Costa Rica. So far no casualties have been reported there. And to Ugg boots now. They may be that easy go-to when strutting the catwalk or just strolling to the mailbox, but it turns out they may actually be causing you injury. A leading orthopaedic surgeon says the comfy boots can cause a knock-kneed stance and the lack of proper foot support may one day have you visiting a surgeon. Well, don't wear them. It shouldn't be used for daily use. I use them as a, a slipper, in, the, <laughs> in a slipper capacity. Around the house, mm. you can go to the edge of your property with Ugg boots. Um, <laughs> Um, if you're renting, just the edge of the actual house itself. <laughs> and that's as far as an Ugg boot should ever go. Of course, it would be good if people did adhere to that advice, but they don't, do they? If they wanted to sort of do something of a, a longitudinal study into the effects of Ugg boots on your knees, they could just hit up every single girl that I went to university with in Dunedin in 2006, because that was the uniform. It was puffer jacket, denim mini, Ugg boots, and they wore them day in, day out. I'm sure there's lots of funny knees. Uh, the, pr the problem with Ugg boots is that they get all hot and sweaty in there. It's like a sauna in there. Ugh. Your feet just end up like a couple of soft walnuts. Yeah. It's disgusting. <laughs> very, very difficult to clean. Now, in her, big, in her first big overseas test, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has stepped onto the world stage at APEC in Vietnam. But her statements have earned a warning from the National Party. After the TPP looked like it was going to spin apart just days ago, it's been resurrected, rebranded and may now be in place by early next year. Meanwhile, the PM says she'll meet this week with Malcolm Turnbull with, with just one agenda to again push for New Zealand to take 150 Manus Island refugees. Well, National's Foreign Affairs man, Jerry Brownlee, says he's surprised how hard she's gone on Australia and has warned her to, quote, proceed with caution. Jerry Brownlee joins us now. This was the Prime Minister's first big test, Jerry, at APEC. What mark would you give us so far? Uh, what you find with all Prime Ministers is that they tend to put aside a whole lot of... Uh, uh, the more, you know, petty aspects of politics uh, to represent the country, and it's quite clear that she's done that uh, uh, with some credit. It's a little unusual to uh, be so aggressive uh, towards another country over a problem that they're trying to deal with. So if you think about the, the Manus Island situation, there's uh, between four and 600 males who are refusing to leave the island. Uh, we've offered to take 150, so even with, if that offer were taken up, the Australians have still got a very big problem. And it's sort of interesting to me that you've got uh, two parties in a minority coalition uh, who campaign to tighten up New Zealand's borders, getting a bit rough on a country that wants to protect its own borders. I see New Zealand's going to host APEC in 2021. You'll be pretty happy about that? Yeah, I think it's going to be a great uh, thing for New Zealand. It's a very expensive thing to host. Uh, and I hope the government uh, does continue with the programme. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are lots of opportunities for showcasing uh, a country like New Zealand. It strikes me that one of the major products of APEC seems to be a photo with everyone wearing silly shirts. Uh, are we, what are we talking about for New Zealand? Any thoughts? 
Well, I, I don't want to preempt anything. Um, there may be a design competition. I might like to enter it, uh, so I don't want to prejudice my position there. We did, but, we uh, did one of those design competitions for silver. our flag. Didn't work too well. <laughs> Taken up any new hobbies since the uh, result of the election? Too soon, too soon. But um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I look. I'm starting to look at TV again, and. Um, Lamenting a little bit of the quality and thinking, well, maybe, you never know. <laughs> You're welcome on, welcome on our show to try and improve it. Uh, yeah. uh, thousands have tried. Jerry Brownlee, really nice to chat to you today. Thank you. Good sport. All right, New Zealand, it's time to talk about this. Oh, oh yeah! Oh, now, I know you guys worked very hard on the show. You've both got your nominations for Best Presenter. That's fine. <laughs> but have you ever put your body on the line? No! Last week I went out to shoot a straightforward piece about the new Ninja Warrior show and returned a broken man. <laughs> In the wild world of Japanese game shows, one warrior reigns supreme. First adapted for the US. Then the Brits. Ninja Warrior has landed down under. Well, across the ditch anyway, and with my invite to Aussie lost in the post, I'm off to Auckland's own ninja course at Jump, which may or may not be a kid's playland. I've dusted off the authentic outfit I bought eight years ago that everyone said I'd never use. She. As they say in the biz, Ninja no jikane! In a traditional show of ninja respect, I let the dojo sensei demonstrate before wowing him with my flawless technique. It wasn't long before the amateurs around us came begging for my ninja knowledge. Now this thing, uh, <laughs> and that'll spin from side to side, so you gotta do both hands at once. <laughs> so it's pretty straightforward. So yeah, you have a go. Okay. Art went away to meditate on my teachings as I continued the solitary path of the ninja warrior. Even just hanging here is such a tax on your forearms and the hands. Half the battle is just hanging on. The sheer weight of your body just pull you off the bar. After decimating obstacle after obstacle, I approached the infamous final ramp. Destiny was within reach. Ah! <laughs> so, Ninja Warrior Australia, it's coming soon to TV3. Yeah, I'll tell you what, the luckiest not a New Zealand show. Otherwise, I've got to go to A&E, guys. I can barely walk. <laughs> oh, my God. There we go. There we go. The Australian Ninja Warrior is tomorrow night on 3 at 7.30. Yeah, so that was bad enough. I mean, Josh got really hurt there. Do you want to tell them part two? <clears throat> yeah, so oh, I just fractured my foot. Um, then went to, after I got back from the hospital, um, uh, my wife went outside to move the bins because I can't do, them, do that anymore because I can't walk. Um, so, but I thought I could put one of the boxes that I was meant to put in the attic up in the attic. So I climbed the box up the stairs and then the attic ladder broke and I <laughs> fell out of the ceiling. Um, <laughs> so my wife came inside and really told me off. Mm. So there we go. Yeah. Okay, part three. Uh, then I was on Seven Days with Jeremy Corbett. We uh, <laughs> had a little tussle. Uh, um, we, we were wrestling on the chair and I fell off the chair and he tried to stop me falling off. Um, and I ended up pulling Jeremy Corbett on top of me. <laughs> and um, I've torn my um, uh, medial collateral uh, uh, tendon uh, in my knees. At least I did the other leg though, right? It was the other yeah, leg, yeah. Was yeah, was yeah. <laughs> really, really disappointing. Oh, Pierre is hoping that there is no part four to this story. <laughs> There's much more to come on the project. We'll see you in a minute. <laughs> Just ahead, what can you learn in 25 minutes of quality TV? We'll run that down next. This is The Project. Ground in dust and dirt doesn't wait for the big weekly clean. So grab the only cord-free vacuum with the Dyson Digital Motor V8 that has powerful suction to clean deep. And up to 40 minutes runtime to clean anywhere, anytime, by anyone. <laughs> Game on! <laughs> Is that all you got? Yeah! Coming through. Never underestimate the power of Energizer, the world's longest lasting AA battery. Coming from petrol, we were sceptical, but the torque is amazing. With the battery line trimmer, there's less fatigue, so there's more accuracy. 
When we use a hedge trimmer, there's no fumes blowing into your face. The brushless motor is lighter than a conventional four-stroke engine. There's no compromising power at all. And we don't smell like petrol anymore. We smell like cut grass. It's your It's time for Rugby News now. And over the weekend, Aussie fullback Kirtley Beale was forced to play in the Ford pack when a teammate got sent off. So let's have a look. There, there he goes. He's on the left there. One of the backs having a go at being the forward. Uh, does not quite know where to get into the scrum. He's just kind of rubbing his head against bottoms there. Classic move. <laughs> now, after the match, Kirtley had a very special visitor. Um, and one of them of the two was very uh, inappropriately dressed. Let's see if you can guess which one. Let's have a look. <laughs> uh, yes, that's the Prince of Wales. Uh, now, if you guess that Kirtley Beale is inappropriately dressed, you're incorrect. They are at a swimming pool and Prince William turned up in a suit, so... <laughs> <laughs> I really blame Kirtley. No. <laughs> All right, if you have just tuned in to see Married at First Sight, congratulations, you are early. Here's what we learned tonight on the project. Well, I uh, learned that for 100 bucks you can get a share in a Dunedin chocolate factory. Apparently for 200 they'll paint a student orange and you get your own oompa loompa. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that regardless of what a new Trans-Pacific partnership brings, sniffing laundry is off the table for our Prime Minister. And I learned very, uh, via a complicated, exhaustive, yet very painful process that if I want to be a ninja, I have to get stronger ankles. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, please thank Jeremy Corbett for joining us tonight. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks to our sponsor, Skoda, as well. We'll see you tomorrow night. Good night. <laughs>